And uh, so we'll speak about uh, fluid responsiveness and uh, how to assess it uh, with uh, ECHO. I have no conflict of interest for this presentation. What are we speaking about? What is the concept of fluid responsiveness? As you know, the relationship between stroke volume and cardiac preload, which is the Frank Starling relationship, is not linear, it's curvilinear. When we give fluid to a patient, we increase cardiac preload. It's with the expectation that we will increase stroke volume and cardiac output, you agree. But the problem is that there is not just one slope, but several slopes of the frank Stalling curve depending on the left ventricular function. And this explains why the same volume expansion with the same increase in cardiac preload could lead to a positive or to a negligible increase in stroke volume and cardiac output. And if you do not attempt to predict fluid responsiveness, it's only half of the patients who respond to fluid administration by a significant increase in cardiac output. All patients do not respond to fluid administration, and uh, I think that the, uh, the, this is a, if we want to get uh, uh, across some important messages, the first one is this one, volume expansion inconstantly results in the expected increase in cardiac output. Then the logical question is how to predict fluid responsiveness. The Wang Wei was used for many, many years, and it was to use the static markers of cardiac preload. What are we speaking about? In fact, the idea was you take the value of a static marker of preload, for instance, central venous pressure. If it's low, you give fluid. If it's high, you don't give fluid. But the problem is that it doesn't work, and the main reason is the basic physiology because you easily understand that a given value of preload does not allow you to predict fluid responsiveness. This is basically due to physiology again. Any static value of preload, preload does not predict fluid responsiveness. Preload responsiveness is not preload, and preload is not preload responsiveness. How to do with echo? What are the static markers of preload with echo? These are the E over A ratio, the left ventricular and diastolic area, and perhaps the best one, the E over E prime ratio. All these values in any patients do not allow you to predict fluid responsiveness, and it's been demonstrated by many studies. For instance, in this one, <coughs> in these patients we gave some fluid, and you see that we divided the population of patients between responders and non-responders, the fluid administration, and you easily see that the E of E prime ratio or the left ventricular endostolic area were similar between patients with and without a positive response to fluid administration. So do not use CVP, do not use the E of E prime ratio to predict fluid responsiveness before giving fluid to your patient. Preload is not preload responsiveness. Then again, the question is uh, how to do, how to predict fluid responsiveness with echocardiography. The first question, of course, and it's always important to, to uh, keep in mind that the first question is, does my patient have a circulatory failure? other indices of shock, for instance. If not, I do not need to give fluid, and by the way, if there is no sign of shock, I do not need to predict fluid responsiveness, okay? Then, should I give fluid? In fact, uh, as we will see, there are some tests that uh, will allow you to predict fluid responsiveness, and we will see five tests that you could use to predict fluid responsiveness before giving fluid. The first test is the respiratory variations of the flow of the left ventricular outflow tract. 
What are we speaking about? In fact, it's a way to test the frank stalling curve at the bedside. Where is the heart of my patient? Does it work here or here? To answer the question, very simply, I will use heart-lung interactions and the effects of mechanical ventilation and hemodynamics. Because we know that in a ventilated patient, each insufflation decreases the cardiac preload because we increase the intrathoracic pressure, we impede the venous return. And so, it means that mechanical ventilation is associated with the cyclic changes in cardiac preload. Then we just have to observe the changes in stroke volume and cardiac output. If mechanical ventilation doesn't change cardiac output or the arterial pulse pressure very much, it means that your patient is fluid and responsive. By contrast, if during mechanical ventilation you observe large changes in the stroke volume, in the arterial pulse pressure, it means that your patient is likely fluid responsive. This is the principle of using the respiratory variations of the hemodynamic signals to predict fluid responsiveness. Of course, you can do it with the arterial pressure, it's the principle of pulse pressure ventilation, but how to do with echocardiography. As you know, to estimate stroke volume with echocardiography, you must measure the velocity time integral in the LV outflow tract. So, how to do to assess the respiratory variation of stroke volume? You just need a five-chamber view. You put the sampling window of pulse dapper in the fifth chamber, meaning just behind the aortic valves here, and you recall this negative flow, and the area here under this, uh, this uh, Doppler uh, signal, which is called the velocity time integral, or VTI, is proportional to stroke volume, meaning that if during mechanical ventilation you have a significant variation in this area, or in the maximal velocity of the signal, it means that your patient is fluid and re fluid responsive. Like here, for instance, in this patient, you see that the variation of the peak velocity here is large, 36%. When we give fluid to this patient, we, uh, we, uh, the, the, the variation disappears. It vanishes here. Okay? And some studies actually demonstrated that this respiratory, uh, respiratory variation of the, uh, uh, the uh, sub-aortic flow allows you to predict fluid responsiveness. For instance, in this study, the cutoff was 13% uh, here to distinguish between responders and non-responders. Never the way. <coughs> Two remarks. The first one is that, of course, you can do it with echo, but if there is an arterial catheter, if you have an, an arterial pressure curve, then it's easier to assess the respiratory variation of pulse pressure. And you know that it's automatically done by many bedside monitors today. I mean that it's, it has exactly the same value. Then, of course, use the easiest one. The second point we must always keep in mind at the bedside is that there are some limitations to using these uh, changes in stroke volume during mechanical ventilation. And the three main limitations are these ones, in case of spontaneous breathing, cardiac arrhythmias, and ARDS, you cannot use these uh, indices. Why? Because you understand that if the respiration is not, uh, is not regular, then of course the variation is inhomogeneous from one cycle to the other. In case of cardiac arrhythmias, it's the same, of course, because the changes in a stroke volume are not related to fluid responsiveness. And also in case of flow tidal volume, because if the tidal volume is very low, it's not enough to, uh, to uh, induce these changes in stroke volume. And the same in case of low lung compliance, because if the lungs are very rigid, 
they do not transmit the changes in alveolar pressure to the changes in the vascular uh, pressures. The problem is that you will agree with me that uh, these situations are quite frequent in the ICU. And so how to do? So respiratory variation of VTI is not valid in case of arrhythmia, spontaneous breathing and area. So how could we do else? We need something else, some other tests to predict fluid responsiveness in case of arrhythmia, spontaneous breathing and ARDS. <coughs> One of the indices we could use is the changes in the diameter of the vena cava. The principle behind is very easy to understand. If mechanical ventilation and the changes in the intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure induce significant changes in the volume and the diameter of the uh, vena cava, it means, or the inferior vena cava, it means that the uh, vessel is quite uh, empty and that you should give fluid to your patient, while if the respiratory variation of this diameter are small, it means that your patient is likely fluid and responsive. And actually, some studies demonstrated that this variation predict fluid responsiveness quite reliably. How to do in practice? You need the subcostal view and then assess with the M mode the variation of the diameter of the inferior vena cava and you see that if <coughs> the patient is preload responsive you observe these large changes in the diameter which by the way are reduced if you uh, give fluid to the patient. As I told you, some studies uh, demonstrated that it's uh, useful to test fluid responsiveness. The cutoff value is around 12 or 13 percent. You can do it with the uh, inferior vena cava, but also with the superior vena cava, and it's been demonstrated years ago by Antoine, and he showed that in patients with fluid responsiveness, they observed the collapsibility of the superior vena cava, which disappears in case of fluid unresponsiveness and after volume expansion, for instance. To assess the diameter of the superior vena cava, you need transesophageal echography. You cannot do it with a transthoracic echocardiography. And he observed that the collapsibility of the SVC was higher than 36% in case of fluid responsiveness, while in the other remaining patients there was no collapsibility of the SVC. And you see that the area under the rack curve in this article was very good, as good as that of pulse pressure variation. Okay. Anyway, the same then for pulse pressure variation, there are some important limitations to keep in mind. You easily understand that in case of spontaneous breathing, it's the same, meaning that you have some irregular changes in the diameter. And also likely, even though it's not demonstrated, in case of EADS, because just like for PPV, if tidal volume is too low, it doesn't trigger significant changes in the diameter of the IVC. Nevertheless, some studies and recently demonstrated that in case of spontaneous breathing activity, you can still use the IVC diameter, although I think that we should be very, very cautious and consider other tests to predict fluid responsiveness in case of spontaneous breathing. Another test that you can use <coughs> to test fluid responsiveness is the passive leg raising test, and you know about this test, of course, you know that the principle, as we wrote years ago with uh, Paul Maric and Jean-Louis de Boulle in Annals of Intensive Care, uh, when you move a patient to a passive leg raised position, you, in fact, transfer some blood from the legs, but also from this planktonic compartment, which is very large, to other cardiac chambers, you perform a self-preload challenge. And, uh, is it reliable? Yes, because many studies actually showed that if you use this test 
to predict read responsiveness, we have some good sensitivity and specificity. And we uh, recently performed this meta-analysis with uh, Paul Marik again and Jean-Louis Teboul, which is uh, going to be published in the next weeks in the intensive care medicine. More than 1,000 patients included in all studies showing that the area under the rack curve is very good to predict read responsiveness. Nevertheless, uh, yes, and how to predict read responsiveness with echo and passive leg raising? Again, what you want to assess are changes in stroke volume during the passive leg raising. It means that you're looking for changes in the VTI of the LVOT flow, meaning that you will measure this VTI before and during the passive leg raise position. Okay? And many studies were um, actually assessed the effects of the PR test with echo, although it's not very easy to do because you have to keep the, the, uh, the sampling window exactly in the same place. In the summer recumbent position and the passive leg raised position, what's not very easy, but uh, if you uh, train yourself a little bit, then you can uh, achieve that. Not so, uh, uh, not so, it's not so difficult, okay. Anyway, you look for changes in VTI because they are, change, they are proportional to changes in stroke volume. It's been demonstrated, I told you, by many studies, and let's keep in mind that to distinguish responders from non-responders, you should look at the changes with the threshold of a 12% increase. One point that must be, that must always kept in mind in case of PLR is that you must assess the effects of the test with a direct assessment of cardiac output, not with the simple blood pressure. And it's actually the main drawback of the passive leg test as we uh, recently uh, explained in this uh, editorial in critical care. Unfortunately, it's not possible to use the simple pulse pressure to assess the effects of the test. Actually, echography is a way to assess uh, uh, cardiac output changes by measuring this VTI, especially in patients with no cardiac output monitoring. Another test you could use is perhaps what's called the end expiratory occlusion test. Do you know about this test? Now have you heard about this. It's another test to uh, predict read responsiveness uh, that we uh, developed here in uh, 2009. The principle behind is very easy to understand again. How to induce some significant changes in preload, let's use again the, uh, the mechanical ventilation. Indeed, during mechanical ventilation, at each insufflation, we impede venous return, okay? Meaning that, meaning that venous return increases and then the next insufflation stops this increase in venous return. And the idea behind the test was that if we stop mechanical ventilation at end expiration, just like for measuring the intrinsic P, for instance, in fact, we stop this impediment in venous return meaning that for a few seconds we increase the cardiac preload. If this increase in cardiac preload results in a significant increase in stroke volume, likely your patient is fluid responsive. You understand? And in this study we showed that the uh, threshold for the increase was a 5% increase in stroke volume. How to assess it? It's very easy if you have a continuous measurement of cardiac output. For instance, here with, uh, with pulse counter analysis, we will stop mechanical vent. I'm sorry, it doesn't work here, the movie. I'm sorry. Could you click on the movie because it's... Uh anyway, it doesn't work. You should uh, see here the interruption of mechanical ventilation, 15 seconds, not less. That's very important to, uh, to, um, to have time enough for the blood to move from the right to the left side. 
And then you observe these changes in this continuous estimation of cardiac index. Then, how to do with echo? Perhaps just by looking at the changes in the VTI during these 15 seconds. And uh, in this study we are performing for the moment, we uh, observed for the, for the moment it's only 10 patients who are included in this uh, uh, preliminary study. We show that actually if the VTI increases by more than 5%, you have a good sensitivity and a very good specificity to test fluid responsiveness. Nevertheless, be cautious because it's only 10 patients here, and of course the study is not published for the moment. And also, let's say that it's not very easy to assess, so you can use it if you have no other way to assess uh, the uh, stroke volume. So the changes in the diameters uh, are reliable, but not valid in case of spontaneous breathing and likely in case of EADS. The pass flick raising is reliable and can be used in these instances, and perhaps that the end expiratory occlusion test uh, is also reliable, but it needs validation with echocardiography. The last test you could use is perhaps the mini fluid challenge. It's been actually described in this study by uh, some uh, French uh, anesthetists, Laurent Muller and uh, Jean-Yves Lefranc. And the idea was that rather than uh, performing a common fluid challenge with 500 milliliters of fluid, I should infuse just 100 milliliters of fluid. It's a mini fluid challenge. And observe the resulting changes in cardiac output. And in this study, they assessed these effect, the effects of this test with echocardiography and you understand now, with changes in the VTI. And they concluded that the test was reliable. Nevertheless, um, be, uh, be uh, careful because 100 milliliters of fluid can only induce small changes in VTI that must be detected with echocardiography. It means that your echo measurement must be precise enough to detect very small changes in the VTI. And by the way, in this study, initially they found that it was a 6% increase. That's why the be that was the best threshold to distinguish between responders and non-responders. But they thought that it was a little bit difficult to advise people to use just a 6% increase. And that's why they eventually uh, said that it's better to look at a 10% increase. Anyway, that's still very small, and so you must be uh, confident enough in your measurements in order to, to... But perhaps it's possible to use other measurements of uh, cardiac output, not only echo, even though it uh, needs to be demonstrated. And so I think that the mini-fluid challenge, especially with echocardiography, requires more uh, validation. Before concluding, I may um, want to invite you to this... Uh, to this uh, event of the French Intensive Care Society, which is called the Paris International Conference. It's in June. It's a two-day meeting at the beginning of June in Paris. And uh, the topic is uh, ERDS. And you see that there is a, a faculty list with the best experts of the world. It's a quite special format with just a, a workshop for 100 people with a, a strong interaction between the speakers and the, uh, and the, uh, and the audience. Uh, so it's uh, likely uh, a, good, uh, a good way to have a standpoint on your knowledge of, uh, about ERDS. And so I invite you, you can connect on our website here, srlf.org, if you want to know more about this uh, PIC uh, 2016. Thank you very much.